Timing is everything for the Fed, for the banking sector, and for asset managers. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm Romain Bostic, in for David Weston. This week, Barclays CEO C.S. Venkatakrishnan on his vision for investment banking. You bring it all together, and you're talking about us thinking about the next generation of leadership of the investment bank. Former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers on whether the Fed's fight to curb inflation is working. I found the Fed's action a little bit confusing. And CBRE CEO Bob Salentic on how interest rates are reshaping America's biggest cities. San Francisco, that's probably the toughest story out there in office buildings. There was a big sigh of relief on Tuesday from Wall Street to Main Street to the halls of the Federal Reserve. The Consumer Price Index released a rise of just 4% year over year. That's the smallest gain going back to March of 2021. And it suggests that the lagged effects of a 15-month rate tightening cycle are lagged no more. I have been consistently in the camp that we would see some <laughs> slowing in growth but no recession, and that we could see inflation come down. Um, and part of that is because I've had confidence in the Fed. Then on Wednesday, a fresh report on supply side inflation hit that showed producer prices rising at the slowest pace since 2020, normalizing supply chains and a broader cooling in commodity costs aiding that trend. Two big data points this week in a disinflationary trend that ultimately gave the Fed enough confidence to stand down after hiking rates 10 straight times. The FOMC decision to hold fire, it was unanimous. And you can call it a pause if you want, but don't you dare call it a skip. I think that the, the skip, I shouldn't call it a skip, the, the decision makes sense. Powell making it clear that the U.S. economy isn't out of the woods yet and more rate hikes could come. I still think, and my, my colleagues agree, that that the risks to inflation are to the upside still. Less than a day after the Fed left borrowing costs unchanged, the European Central Bank raised its deposit rate to the highest in more than two decades. But investors, they're betting that after four percentage points worth of hikes, the ECB, along with other major central banks, they're finally at the final stages in their onslaught against the global inflation shock. We are determined to reach our target in a timely manner and to continue to apply the principles that we have applied today data dependency, the three elements of the reaction function, and moving meeting by meeting. Meanwhile, the European banking sector entering a new era. UBS completing the government broker takeover of its storied Swiss rival Credit Suisse. It's the biggest global banking merger since the 2008 financial crisis. And time finally may be up for Chris Minotti. Ousted from his London-based investment firm amid sexual assault allegations, OD Asset Management now hiving off its funds and employees, a move that would likely signal the end of the multi-billion pound firm altogether. Clients and business partners up against the clock right now to get their money out. We're in the process of moving away from, from that business. And back here in the U.S., stocks scoring their best week since March. The S&P 500 climbing more than 2% and the NASDAQ 100 jumping by almost 4%. That move higher in the U.S. matched by moves overseas. Japanese stocks pushing to their highest since 1990. The German DAX closing at a record high in one of the main gauges, tracking emerging market equities, advancing for a third straight week. Even commodities got bought, posting their strongest weekly performance as a group going back to November. Joining us now to walk us through what happened this week and, well, what could happen in the weeks ahead. Sanal Desai, Franklin Templeton Fixed Income CIO, and Bloomberg Managing Editor Tracy Alloway, the co-host of the very popular Odd Lots podcast. And I'll, I'll start with you, and I'll start with that Fed meeting on Wednesday and that press mm -hmm. conference. Not necessarily a surprise what they did, but were you surprised at what Powell had to say? So, you know, I actually feel in some ways that Powell got a little bit of the short end of the stick this time around. I've historically been quite critical of the communication that the Fed does. But I think this time around, they paused for a very valid reason. They hadn't guided the market. Well, valid in some people's minds, this Fed doesn't like surprising the market, and it chose not to do so. However, I think they really made it clear that sometimes a pause is really just a pause, and that's what this meeting was. 
prior to the meeting, there was a reasonable quantity of people who thought, a reasonable portion of the market, which believed that the pause was really the end of the hiking cycle. It's not. Mm -hmm. That's abundantly clear. And I think that we saw action from the uh, from the, RB, the Bank of Canada, from the Reserve Bank of Australia, both in recent weeks have come back. For yeah. recent months have come back from causes. And so I think the market is beginning to be more realistic about what the Fed's outlook is here. Uh, how do you feel about that, Tracy? We say a pause is just a pause. And of course, uh, even Jay Powell had that Freudian skip uh, during the press conference there. Is there some <laughs> distinction that we should be paying attention to here? Freudian skip? Was that a, a Freudian slip of your own there, Romaine? Or no, just a I really good I've been working on that all day long. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. That, I really appreciate that. No, I mean, I, I agree with Sinal to some extent. I think the confusion arises because you had a pause, which is not a hike. And then if you looked at the longer term dot plot, it, it was clearly indicating tighter policy. So people are trying to reconcile those two messages. That said, you know, the linguistic debate over whether it was a hawkish pause or a skip, I tend to lean towards a skip. I was reading, uh, funnily enough, Tim Dewey um, before I came on the show, and he was making the case that he thought the Fed had made up its mind basically back in May to pause at this particular meeting. Of course, they're not allowed to say so. Each meeting is supposed to be you know, an independent decision, data dependent. Mm -hmm. But that said, if you look at the data that's coming out between now and July, there isn't a ton of it. I think Nick Tamaros from the Wall Street Journal actually asked pal this question. And so the conspiracy theory now is that, well, maybe the decision for a hike in July has already been made. Well, so now I'll pick up on that here. I love a good conspiracy theory. I am curious. I mean, it's one thing to say we don't want to surprise the market. If this is how they guide it, great, follow through with that. But was the data, the data that they're looking at, the same data that I'm sure you see and that Tracy sees, was that supportive of a pause? I think you're looking at the wrong data. Romaine, you should be looking at core. Mm. Core is at 5.3. Core CPI has essentially not budged in over a year. If you pull that chart up, I'll th I think you will see what the Fed is looking at. And right now, core is higher than headline. And I think this is going to remain the case for a major part of the remainder of the year. That core CPI, which is something we've been focused on now for a couple of years, is very, very sticky. And it is following the trend that we're seeing from wages, which are still growing at roughly core. So if I look at those two factors together, I think the Fed has every reason to continue to hike. Mm -hmm. And after hiking, I think the more interesting thing is that they expect to cut a reasonable amount. The market expects them to cut even more. I'm not sure that we're going to get as much by way of cuts and what I would consider the resting point for Fed funds after we've hiked call it to 550, call it to 575, eventually the Fed will cut. And I think it will cut quite substantially because it's going to take us back because it will presumably cut because it needs to stimulate yeah. a slowing economy. It might take us back to 2.25. But uh, after that, I don't think that's where the Fed stays. That's where I disagree with the Fed right now. I, I am, And I, I think there is some disagreement in the market as well, Tracy. We talk about the big rally that we saw in equities. The moves that we saw in the fixed income space seem to suggest a little bit more, I think, along the lines of what Sanal is thinking herself. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to say, like, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable to be optimistic. But in some respects, you saw a lot of optimism on Wall Street today that was reflected in things like risk assets, things like equities. And it makes some sense. I mean, to the Fed's credit, just last year, Powell was talking about how it would be extremely difficult to get inflation down to target without below trend growth. And yet here we are in 2023. It does seem like inflation is beginning to reduce, although to Sanal's point, it's still double the 2% target, of course. However, it's happening while growth is still relatively strong. We haven't seen a substantial increase in wages. We certainly haven't seen a rise, a significant rise in unemployment. And people are starting to talk about that proverbial soft landing. Now, how you define it, does the Fed have to get back to 2% in order to have achieved officially the soft landing? I think that's open to debate. But mm -hmm. I am seeing a lot of people talking about upside risks at the moment. 
All right, we're just getting this conversation started. I do want to get both of your thoughts here on the, what actually is driving uh, some of the sentiment, some of that optimism out there. We're in conversation right now with Sonal Desai over at Franklin Templeton and Tracy Alloway, the co-host of the Odd Lot podcast. We're going to talk about survival of the fittest in the AI space. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. We think it will create some of the most valuable companies the market's ever seen. And I think it's certainly driven companies like Cisco, given them the life that they've had. It's obviously also spectacularly volatile. The market has pulled back in this sector since it came public, since it began in 1995. It's pulled back 30 to 50 percent at least seven or eight times. All right, a blast from the past there, Henry Blodgett, then the Internet analyst over at Merrill Lynch back in June of 2000 when he appeared with Louis Ruckheiser on Wall Street Week. Internet stocks were all the rage then, and to a certain extent, they're the rage now. It's all about AI, artificial intelligence, and that has been the dominant part of the conversation surrounding equity markets. Sanal Desai over at Franklin Temple is still with us, along with Bloomberg's Tracy Alloway. And Tracy, I want to start with you here because there are a lot of people trying to uh, look for some parallels between the AI frame frenzy that we're seeing today and the dot-com frenzy, if you will, that we saw back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Are you finding that parallel? Yeah, I mean, there is no doubt that we are going to see shades of dot com in some of some of the enthusiasm around AI. I mean, I was looking at NVIDIA's um, valuation before I came on here. I think it's something like 42 price to sales at the moment, which is um, a lot. And we have seen some companies already start to pivot towards AI. So, of course, a lot of the crypto players um, that aren't doing so well at the moment are now talking a lot about this new technology. The one difference, I think, I was actually at an event with um, Mark Barabo, PGIM's global equity head this week, and he was talking about the difference is a lot of the AI winners so far are incumbent companies. They're hmm. places like NVIDIA, places like Microsoft. These are real companies with actual revenue. And from that perspective, we are in a different place to, say, 2020, 2021, where people were betting on the really speculative stuff. I know it's a low bar, but it does bear mentioning that, to some extent, these are people betting on already incumbent established companies. That's a good point. And, Sonal, I want to get your thoughts on that, particularly mm -hmm. just in the context of investor sentiment and really this idea that there does seem to be a lot of folks out there who really sort of want to, I guess, grab on to that next big thing. And at least for right now, it seems like it might be AI. It does look like this is going to be the decade of AI, really. If you think about the last decade as the decade of mobility, the de you know, if you look at the 2010 to through 2020, uh, I am not an equity specialist. I always make that case. But I do, do think that this decade that we're in right now is likely to be the decade of AI. I'm not the person to pick individual stocks clearly. I'm the last person to do so. But if I look at the technology, it is something we're very excited about. Having said that, there are many other technologies, whether you're looking at what's going on in the field of medicine with genomes. There's a, there's a lot happening in technology more broadly. AI, ha AI is very much the flavor of the month. So that is the element which goes back to what we were talking about, the dot com, so to some extent, I'd say. Absolutely. And Tracy, I mean, you bring up, bring up a good point here about kind of these established players, the NVIDIA's, Microsoft's, Alphabet's, proven companies with relatively solid balance sheets here. But there is certainly uh, some froth in this as well, a sort of a lot of second and third tier companies that have uh, mentioned AI. Your colleague, Joe Weisenthal, the co-host of uh, Odd Lots, I thought had a great point when he talked about Kroger, a grocery store chain, where the CEO mentioned AI eight times on the conference call. I'm having a hard time making that connection, but I don't know. Maybe they know something we don't. I mean, look, I do think there is a danger here that everyone starts using AI as basically a synonym for every type of software that's currently in existence. I, I can see that happening. However, when it comes to the Kroger earnings call, sure, he said AI eight times, but the stock still went down, which to me suggests that people are still being somewhat rational about this. That said, there are plenty of pockets of irrationality mm -hmm. um, in the market. So uh, there's something called the bubble 
portfolio that mm. GAM uh, portfolio manager Paul McNamara put together many, many years ago, and it contains a bunch of stuff like Tesla, Netflix, Chinese tech companies, real estate developers. That thing has shot back up, I think something like 30% so far this year, which is about double the S&P performance. So clearly people are piling back in to some low quality names. That said, a lot of those names are coming off of significant lows. So what does it mean if a company goes from, you know, 10 bucks to 20 bucks? Yeah. That's a doubling of performance, but it's still relatively low compared to prior history. Yeah, that's actually a great uh, index or I guess a sort of hypothetical index uh, out there to track here. Thanks to both of you. A great conversation. Tracy Alloway, she's managing uh, uh, editor here at Bloomberg and co-host of the Odd Lots podcast. And Sonal Desai, Franklin Templeton, CIO for Fixed Income. Coming up here, a new wealth management giant on the block. We're going to hear from the Barclays CEO on what it means for his business. This is Bloomberg. This week, banking saw its biggest merger since the financial crisis. UBS completing its acquisition of Credit Suisse, creating a global wealth management powerhouse. We heard from the Barclays CEO, C.S. Venkatakrishnan. He sat down with David Weston to talk about what it means for his bank. Credit Suisse and UBS's merger has two important consequences. One, for the financial system as a whole, it has stabilized it because a slightly wobbly GCFE bank is no longer there. It's absorbed into UBS in a very solid transaction. The second is, as UBS develops its business model, it will be for Barclays both an important client for our markets business mm -hmm. and a competitor for us in investment banking. Uh, but that's the way all large banks are with each other these days. Megan, how do you keep score? I mean, uh, one way we look at it is price to book. And your price to book right now is somewhere around 0.44. You're lagging behind most of your competitors. Do you pay attention to price to book? And if so, how do you get that price to book back up? So I pay a lot of attention to price to book. It's, it's probably the single most important metric for a bank. And a bank's price to book is dependent on one of two things, improving the quality of your assets or improving your profitability. We have excellent assets. So it's our profitability and the scaling of our profitability that we are focused on. So within the UK consumer business and the investment bank, as I said, we are at scale and we look to continue to perform well. And then the other three businesses are areas where we would like to grow our scale. Our investment bank is about 60% of the bank. In a way, it's been very successful. And what we would like to do is, while keeping its momentum, growing the rest of the bank outside of the investment bank. How much of the investment bank are the bankers that you have? Because you have had some exodus to, to Jefferies, to other places, uh, and you've remarked about it, actually. Yeah. Uh, what is the issue there? Why are you losing investment bankers? Are you losing the ones you want to lose? So first of all, we are losing a few investment bankers, but not that much more than what is normal annual turnover. I mean, this is the period in the first few months of the second quarter when people have been paid their bonuses and there's a little bit of musical chairs, as you know. Mm -hmm. It's a time-honored tradition in this industry. Uh, we made a management change in our investment bank. We spent a lot of time last year thinking about what we expected the banking landscape to be over the next decade. So what you've seen is rising interest rates, changing business models, the importance of sectors that are fairly new to the economy, not just technology, but sustainability, mobility, climate tech. And then there is just the different players and the importance of the players in the banking market. The private equity groups have been very large. Private credit funds are becoming bigger. They're slightly disintermediating what banks are doing. And we, as we began with a very American investment bank here in the U.S., based from the Lehman acquisition of Barclays, and we've grown in Europe, we wanted to put more emphasis in Europe as well. So you bring it all together, and you're talking about us thinking about the next generation of leadership of the investment bank. Building on our strengths in debt capital markets, but growing in equities, growing in M&A, growing in Europe. 
And when you do that kind of organizational change, sometimes it has impacts. Well, you suggested something I was curious about. Is, is there a strategic shift in emphasis in the investment bank a little bit away from the United States and toward Europe? Because as I recall, your two co-heads before were based in the United States. The two co-heads now are going to be based in Europe. One is in Europe and one is here in the US. So the, this, it's not a shift so much as an expansion. It is to try to give more attention to Europe, relatively speaking. The US remains critically important to us. And the U.S. businesses are some things, especially in the debt capital markets, where we are absolutely leading and we want to maintain that position. Uh, absolutely leading in debt capital markets. What about equity? Are you shifting toward equity? We are trying to expand and grow our business in both equities and advisory. When you look at U.S. expansion, where would you be expanding if you're expanding the United States? I would love to grow our credit card business even more. Mm -hmm. And then our investment banking and trading businesses. As I said, we are the largest non-U.S. bank but there's always room to increase our market share and our reach. There's been a little bit of the shaking up, if I can put it that way, in the U.S. banking system with some of the regional banks, starting with Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, what do you make of that situation more broadly? Do you expect more bank failures in the United States? I, I'm not sure I expect failures. What I expect is concerns and banks cleaning up their act, if you like. So banks which have asset liability problems will go get ahead of it. They will try to sell assets. I think the net effect of it will be a curtailment or diminishment of lending, especially in middle America where the regional banks have a footprint. Are you tightening your credit standards right now? So the big banks, I think, all tightened our wholesale credit standards through the leverage finance business last year. And uh, you know there were many large loans. Some didn't get placed. And so the, the wholesale banks, with rising rates, tightened their credit standards. The retail standards, we have tightened it but they are marginally tighter than they were, say, during COVID. I think what you're going to see in the regional banks is a tightening of credit standards in areas like commercial real estate, small business lending, the things that they do. So you said the magic words, commercial real estate. Yeah. How exposed is Barclay to commercial real estate, first of all? Not very much. We, uh, we do some direct lending in the UK, but it's small. And in the US, we mostly finance vehicles or portfolios of commercial real estate assets. Uh, but we, you know, have adequate protection in, in, in terms of first loss protections and uh, loan to values. There are some fairly substantial assets that probably have not been marked to market yet, particularly in the real, commercial real estate area. What is the likely effect of that to be on the banking system in the United States, but also more broadly in the economy? So I think two things will happen. As they get marked down, some lenders and some investors will be exposed. Hopefully, it's equity investors and people who invest in them through hedge funds or private equity vehicles. Then there will be banks who might get exposed. And then ultimately, I think, as in all real estate cycles, there will be a surplus of supply, meaning empty buildings. And then over time, that will adjust itself. You know how to manage risk, control risk. We've seen a fair amount of risk recently coming from odd places. I mean, Jeffrey Epstein with respect to private uh, wealth. Uh, we've seen it just with Chrisman O'Day over in the UK with prime brokerage. You're pretty big in prime brokerage. We saw it before with Archegos. How do you manage for very, very large clients like that who, I'll put it, go off the rails? Yeah. David, it's a very difficult question. It's a very important question. At the heart of our business, we are dealing with people. And assessing the people, know your client, as they say, is really important. I think, on the one hand, we like to see successful people and work with them. We also believe in, generally, we believe in the goodness of human character, and we believe in human redemption. On the other hand, you've got to be fairly clinical about the reputational risks some of these people pose to our businesses. So I think it's important to assess your client when you onboard them and assess them periodically and be very hard-nosed if there's bad news. Well, what about the technology? Last question, AI. We hear a lot about generative AI. What does that hold out for Barclays as potential opportunities? Tremendous potential in how you service your clients, how you produce documents, and, and how you sort of manage the business. Equally. We are a large regulated institution with very strict controls over information. So we've got to make sure we use it in the right way. That was Barclays CEO C.S. Venkata Krishnan. Coming up, whether or not bosses want their employees back in the office, the economy certainly does. CBRE CEO Bob Salentic says office vacancies might be the new norm. You really are seeing a push from companies to get people back in. I do not think it's going to go back to where it was.
That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Commercial real estate. Bloomberg estimates it to be a $20 trillion market, one that benefited from years of low interest rates. But all that changed when the Fed hiked rates at record speed. Rates go up, the financial conditions tighten, and then what happens is that consumption drops, investment drops, and then we get job destruction. Even as offices remained empty in the wake of the pandemic. It's shocking to me that the vacancy rate uh, for commercial uh, space in San Fran is 35%. Hitting valuations hard. You're seeing B office buildings that had a $600 million valuation or a $300 million valuation being sold for maybe 50 or 60. With the potential for the problem to spread to the banking sector, particularly for the regional banks responsible for much of the commercial real estate lending. I think you're gonna see more bank failures, likely in the small banks, so it's not gonna be the big headlines and the size of the failures we had so far, but I think there's more problems under the surface. Though banking experts like Raj Cohen say it may be a more narrowly focused problem than some think. I think only a small slice of commercial real estate is really being effective, and that slice is office buildings in a few metropolitan areas. And even there, there are vast differences in credit quality. And Steve Ross of Related insists that the problem does not extend to the top tier of office buildings. Tenants today are looking to find Class A office buildings that are new, that embody all the latest in technology and where people want to work. It's really the Class B buildings where the carnage will take place. But any way you cut it, as banking goes, so goes commercial real estate. The key to commercial real estate today, though, will be banking. If the industry can't get a construction loan, real estate will have a recession. And to take us into the world of commercial real estate, where it is now, where it's going, we welcome now someone who knows it terribly well. He's Bob Salentic. He is the president and CEO of CBRE. Thank you so much for joining us, Bob. Great to have you here on Wall Street Week. Thanks for having me, David. Really nice to be with you. So we hear a lot about commercial real estate right now, not all of it good. A lot of focus on office buildings. But we've learned that commercial real estate is more than just office buildings. It's part of it, but not all of it. Give us a sense overall how commercial real estate is doing. Well, of course, office buildings are the most difficult part of the commercial real estate story today. When you look at other asset classes, so for instance, industrial buildings, which is a big asset class, um, medical office buildings, um, hotels, uh, life sciences buildings, multifamily um, institutional quality apartment buildings, um, basically very strong fundamentals. And when I say fundamentals, I mean the following. Um, well leased, in fact, some of them historically well leased, uh, strong rental rates and upward pressure on rental rates in a lot of cases, not a lot of new supply coming on. Um, that's what we mean by fundamentals. And when you get beyond office buildings, the fundamentals in the commercial real estate group of asset classes is, are generally very strong. And even within office buildings, there's a slice of office buildings, I'm going to say for 30 to 40 percent of them, these newer uh, better configured, uh, better infrastructure office buildings where companies are trying to create a really high quality experience for their employees to get them back in the office. Those assets are doing quite well. So the store, the headlines, the headline grabbing stories of an 80% vacant office building, that's an anecdote. That's not a proxy for what's going on in commercial real estate. So when you talk about the newer buildings, we're learning to call them A's or A, A pluses as opposed yeah. to B's and C's. Yes. But if you take a look at commercial real estate, the office portion of it right now, how much of it's A, how much of it's B, how much of it's C would you say in general? Yeah. Well, I think if you look at true A or A plus, it's maybe a quarter of the uh, a quarter of the space out there. But you could go down a little further and have some very nice buildings that if upgraded appropriately would be true A's. And then you probably have the bottom quarter or so that are real problematic buildings that are either gonna have to be mega redeveloped or probably scraped and turned into land sites. And then in between you have a variety of different kinds of buildings, some of which can be repurposed maybe into multifamily. All that's very difficult to do. 
Uh, some of them will be upgraded to Class A buildings, and some of them will go the way of land also. So you have different parts to commercial real estate, and then within the office part of commercial real estate, you've got different classes to look at. What about geography? Because another thing that we have heard is that it depends on what metropolitan area you're talking about. San Francisco may be troubled. New York may be not so great. Chicago, but then there are others, whether it is uh, uh, Miami, for example, some parts of Texas are doing pretty well. Well, you, you mentioned San Francisco first. So that's, that's probably the toughest story out there in office buildings. Uh, and it's for more reasons than just the tough to get people back in the office. First of all, everybody knows that's where so much concentration of uh, tech occupancy is. Those companies have laid off a lot of people. But David, think about this. We all know that the technology companies that are going backwards with headcount now are going to go the other direction for sure in the long run. We know that's going to happen. And that part of what's going on is going to come back. And then, of course, you do have the cyclical thing with the, uh, with the economy being down a little bit. And you have the secular thing with people not being back in the office as much. And, and technology companies kind of led that charge. But by the way, if you see what's going on now, the technology companies are talking about getting their people back into the office. Talking about it, but are they getting that done? I mean, we just this week passed the milestone in New York of 50 percent occupancy, yeah. and that is by use of the sort of security cards. So they know they're actually in the office. Is it ever going to come back to where it was before? Um, well, New York is a good example of quite a bit of uh, the spectrum of what's going on. So in, in Class A top quality buildings here in New York, you go over to Hudson Yards or you go to one Vanderbilt in Midtown across from uh, Grand Central Station, these buildings are doing well and they're going to continue to do well. And they're doing well because they create a great, uh, um, a great story for the client or for the uh, tenants and their people, a great experience for their people. Other buildings are suffering more because they don't create that experience, but they're all slowly filling up. We did see a flat spot for quite a while. I'm going to say from earlier this year till about now, but we're starting to see it rise a little bit again now, and you really are seeing a push from companies to get people back in. I do not think it's going to go back to where it was, and in fact, the work we've done would suggest that in the long run, companies are going to take maybe... 80% uh, of the space, maybe as little as 75% of the space as they previously had. As you mentioned, there's the financing aspect as well. We read a lot right now about maybe some arrears building up, maybe some concern about needing to refinance this year. What is the situation in financing of office buildings right now? What are the risks out there? Uh, well, we've looked at that every way you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with banks. So you've heard a lot, we've all heard a lot uh, because of some of the bank challenges we had a couple months ago that uh, commercial real estate was gonna put a lot of pressure on banks and office buildings in particular were gonna put a lot of pressure on banks. The facts are about, about one and a half, one and a half percent of bank assets or in office building loans, one and a half percent. And that's all office building loans? All office building loans. Now we think that there, there is gonna be some jeopardy among that portfolio of loans, but we think it's gonna be like 20, 25% of those loans. So take 25% of one and a half percent, and you can see that uh, the banks aren't gonna have a really big problem coming from commercial real estate. They will have some problems. They will have some loans that need to be restructured. They'll have some foreclosures. We know that some of that's going on already. But again, this headline, this anecdotal driven, sensationalized headline about all the crashing down that's going to take place, it's really overstated. Putting aside crashing down, there are some adjustments going on. How far along are we in that adjustment period, particularly with respect to valuations? Obviously, valuations come down, both because interest rates are going up, so it's more expensive to finance things, but there's somewhat less demand for at least some office buildings. Where are we on that adjustment of valuations? Well, I mentioned all those asset classes uh, earlier in our mm -hmm. discussion. Values have come down for all those asset classes. Uh -huh. And the reason, one of the real drivers of that is the cost of debt goes up. When yeah. the cost of debt goes up, uh, it's more expensive to leverage your buildings, the value of the equity goes down. Office buildings have gone down the most. Um, the other asset classes may have gone down 10, 15 percent. Office buildings maybe as much as 30 percent. We do think that the decline in values has kind of run its course and will stabilize now and will start to come back later this year. The fact of the matter is interest rates have stabilized. We think they're going to uh, start to come down. 
Uh, inflation appears to have peaked. It's coming down. And so we think the decline in values has kind of uh, played out. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think what I'm hearing you say is, by and large, looking at as far as you can, you think maybe the market has largely discounted what it needs to discount at this point. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. Now, we all, we all need to figure out what's going to go on with the economy. Right now, uh, the economy has performed better than we thought it was going to perform, quite a bit better around the world. In fact, there's now an expectation that we won't even have a recession in Europe. Um, if we ended up with a, a, a worse recession than we think we're going to get, values would come down further because people would stop spending money of all types, including uh, try to spend less on rents. But we think uh, values have kind of hit the bottom, are going to start recovering, and we think, we believe that we're going to have a mild recession that's going to take place later this year, be relatively short, and you'll start to see things come back. By the way, there is a massive amount of capital on the sidelines that wants to invest in commercial real estate. And there is a massive amount of real estate that wants to be refinanced or sold, and everybody's uncertain about what's going on with values. And as soon as we have some certainty, as soon as we think interest rates have peaked and are coming down, you'll start to see those assets trade and get refinanced. As in so many forth. places, you need the buyer and the seller to agree on that price. Yeah, and okay. you need them to be confident that it's kind of gotten where it's going to get to. That was David Weston with CBRE CEO Bob Salentic. Coming up, former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers gives us a reality check of the Fed's battle with inflation. I don't see the idea that we've got a durable reduction in, in inflation clearly established. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Monetary policy dominated the week with rate decisions from the U.S. Fed, the European Central Bank, and the People's Bank of China. Three big central bank meetings and three divergent outcomes. Let's get the view from Larry Summers, former U.S. Treasury Secretary, President Emeritus at Harvard University, and now a special contributor to Wall Street Week. Larry, let's talk about the Fed meeting, more importantly, that Fed pause. Not necessarily a surprise, but do you think it was appropriate? I'm not sure. I found the Fed's action a little bit uh, confusing. I understand the arguments for not hiking uh, this, at this meeting, but those arguments wouldn't point towards signaling two further rate increases. They wouldn't point towards significantly revising the forecasts towards a stronger economy and more inflation. I understand the arguments uh, for having gone the other way, but I don't really understand the internal consistency of an approach of pausing at this meeting, but then signaling two further uh, rate hikes down the road and signaling that they no longer expect unemployment to increase nearly as much as they used to expect it. So this meeting felt like it was driven as much by the internal political dynamics of the Fed as by any consistent and coherent reading of uh, the economic situation. And that was a bit disturbing uh, to me. They raised some of their economic projections, or at least they improved a little bit here. But you still have a market that seems to be betting on this idea of a recession, the idea that the Fed itself may have actually over-tightened or at least is on its way to doing that. That would not be my best guess. Uh, I think it's very hard to read, but my best guess is that uh, the consumer, which is 70 percent of the economy, appears to be running really uh, quite uh, strong at this point. We've got very strong employment data, much faster than uh, population growth. The indicators on wages are a bit mixed, but the ones that seem most reliable to me that adjust for changes in the composition of the labor force are showing a substantial uh, strength. So I don't see the idea that we've got a durable reduction in, in inflation clearly established, nor do I see clear evidence of a slowing uh, coming. So in that context, uh, I think the Fed has probably got to maintain 
a posture of moving towards restraint. I don't think it's very serious what the precise timing uh, is. And so if they don't move uh, this time and they end up uh, lifting rates 50 basis points at the next two meetings, that's going to be OK uh, as an outcome. But I think that they ought to decide what their balancing of risks is. Mm -hmm. And I was struck that the balancing of risks that was implicit in not moving today, this time, was kind of inconsistent with the balancing of risks that was, in, that was signaled by the two tightenings and by uh, the forecast uh, revisions. I want to go uh, overseas uh, to China. Uh, they had a much different policy meeting coming out of the People's Bank of China, a cut. And there's been a lot of discussion here, Larry, about the health of the Chinese economy in light of the data we've gotten and in light of some of the reports by Bloomberg and others that they are considering uh, fiscal or at least some sort of economic stimulus measures to get that economy back going back again. You, you know, I, I think the Chinese have a very difficult... Uh, set of challenges ahead of them. There are very serious financial overhangs uh, coming out of what's happening in uh, real estate. I take a somewhat more medium-term view of it. And what's an economy about? An economy is about people, and it's about capital. And what we know is that the number of births in China has fallen by almost 50 percent in the last six years. Even though they eliminated the one-child policy, the number of births has kept uh, really falling. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, Bloomberg reported that the number of millionaires leaving China was kind of high, high by historical standards and high by global standards. Now, that's a funny measure in a lot of ways. But if you look at measures of attempted capital flight from China, they look to be pretty strong. And if you look at measures of capital inflow, what you saw from Sequoia, uh, where they were splitting off their Chinese, China business a week or two ago, is indicative of a lot of things that are happening. So whether it's uh, supply of people, investment in uh, new capital, I think you've got some fundamental bets that aren't running that positive uh, in China. Yeah. And that's going to be a challenge along with the nearer term issues uh, for uh, the Chinese economy. And so that's something that for them I'm worried about. And I think that's something that's going to point towards uh, there being more softness in commodity prices globally than uh, many might have expected. And we've seen a certain amount of that in the oil market. Uh, let's uh, move over uh, to, the Euro to the European uh, Union, Larry. We got the ECB uh, rate decision, a hike as expected, and discussion from Christine Lagarde that the market should expect additional hikes here. When you look at economic conditions over there and you look at monetary policy here, are they in sync? You know, I don't think the objective really is to have policies in sync. I think the objective is to have policies appropriate to particular circumstances and then to let uh, exchange rates adjust. And I think the inflation issue is probably a more severe one in terms of Europe. They haven't moved nearly as far as we have in the face of somewhat greater threats. So I think the uh, European actions were uh, broadly appropriate, and I think they're going to very likely need to uh, continue acting, especially given that I think that monetary policy in the United States is more likely to surprise in terms of tighter rates uh, than it is to surprise in terms of greater ease. Before I let you go, Larry, I mean, I was just trolling through your Twitter feed here, uh, and I saw you tweeted out something uh, related to a paper uh, on the IRS. There's been a lot of discussion here about the funding for the IRS, about the funding and its capability of auditing folks, and more importantly, the return that it gets off of those audits. Look, we don't have many better investments in government. Uh, what this study, which is the most careful one done uh, to date by my colleagues at Harvard, Nathan Hendren and 
Ben Sprung Kaiser, along with uh, government officials, finds is that a dollar invested in increased revenues, uh, increased enforcement with respect to top 1% taxpayers, people who are audited at a rate of only a little more than uh, 1%, people who in some cases file returns and the statute of limitations runs and the IRS doesn't even notice, that a greater investment in those uh, that area of tax audits can pay off twelve dollars in every ta in extra revenue for every dollar that uh, is uh, invested, and it's got to be in that context uh, penny penny wise and uh, ton foolish to be underfunding uh, the IRS. Larry, always wonderful to talk to you. Larry Summers there, uh, President Emeritus over at Harvard, former U.S. Treasury Secretary and special contributor here to Wall Street Week. Coming up, central banks are trying to get a handle on inflation, but Beyonce might be making things more complicated. The price pressures from Queen Bee and her hive next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought on inflation and the blame game. For almost two decades now, the headline inflation rate in the United States averaged at or below 2%. That lull broken in a big way by a pandemic, by supply chain disruptions, and by fiscal stimulus that turbocharged consumer spending. Effects that the Fed at the time deemed transitory. We've had several months of high inflation that um, most economists, including me, believe will be transitory. By the time the Fed began to raise rates last year to curb inflation, the CPI index was on its way to 9%. Team transitory benched, and the narrative shifted to the labor market and to employee compensation. As businesses were forced to pay workers more, the legend goes, companies passed those costs on to consumers, a wage growth spiral. There's still a lot of work to do when it comes to wages and getting them down to a tolerable uh, pace of growth that meets the Fed target. But a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. What if rather than wages being a large driver of inflation, inflation was driving wages? It's not just semantics. A recent analysis by San Francisco Fed economist Adam Shapiro argued that the high correlation between wages and inflation doesn't actually equate to causation. In fact, his research found that when you look at a key CPI measure, less than 5% of the run-up in that measure could be explained by employment costs alone. Former Fed Chair Ben Bernanke last month co-authored a paper that also poked holes in the wage spiral theory, saying that while the strength of aggregate demand led to a tightening of the labor market, the tighter labor market didn't create much inflation. The data backs that up, and eventually so too did Jay Powell. I do not think that wages are the principal driver of inflation. I think there are many things. I think wages and prices tend to move together. And it's very hard to say what's causing what. So what is to blame? Housing, used cars, fiscal stimulus, or is it Beyonce? Oh, yeah, Beyonce. Economists over at Danske Bank in Europe, doing yeoman's work, I should add, say they found that a recent resurgence in inflation in Sweden overlapped with the kickoff of Beyonce's Renaissance World Tour at the Friends Arena in Stockholm. It was a two-night appearance, and that two-night appearance contributed to a large increase in hotels, airfare, and other recreation prices. Now, to be fair, the Beyoncé effect is likely to be truly transitory. But the tour, it does land this weekend in the Netherlands, and the CPI data for that country is set to be released a couple weeks later. I'm just saying. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm Romaine Bostic. We'll see you next week.